So what is the value of a commercial photograph? And how do we determine this sort of thing? Today, we'll examine this, so buckle up. Hey folks, Jeff here. So today we're gonna to be discussing the value of your work. Specifically, in photography, we're gonna be talking about commercial photographs. But first, we need to take a quick look at some of the history of this. If we go back in time, sort of the pre-digital era, uh, you know, if we look at, say, the portrait and wedding model, uh, often that sort of business model was set up based upon a, you know, the if it was a portrait session, it would be like the, the sitting fee, right? And then uh, the session would take place, so there'd be a fee to come in and be photographed. Um, and then you would come back later, and the photographer would sit you down with a stack of proof prints to, to look through them, and then they would offer you other print products, right? Uh, offering framing and albums and that sort of thing. And that that's where their margin was. You know, with wedding photographers, it was not too dissimilar in that, you know, you would show up the wedding day and you would photograph the wedding day, and then the, you would meet up with the client later and show them the work from the day, and then you would be looking to try to sell them the next product, which was, you know, like a wedding album, in some cases, maybe large prints if they're into that. Um, and, and that, again, was, you know, more opportunity for the photographer to make a little bit more money. In both scenarios for the portrait and wedding photographer, it, the end user is direct to customer, right? Uh, also known as consumer or retail photography. And the real key there is that they're using those images for their own personal use. Whereas in the commercial photography world, a photographer is hired to be able to take this idea and put it onto film, okay? And it wasn't a particularly easy thing to be able to put an idea onto transparency film and do it really well. For a client to spring for the cost to hire a photographer who has the skill to shoot transparency film and then spring for the cost for the film to be scanned, they didn't want to just do this willy-nilly, you know, oh, we don't know what we're doing with the images. They, they would know what they're doing with the images. Some cases it would be like a, uh, a limited need. It would say, you know, oh, well, we need to do this photograph because we have a single page ad we're looking to run in a specific publication. Or maybe it's a really broad usage. You know, you think of like the menu boards in a place like McDonald's, you know, photographer photographing all of the necessary menu items and then those are going on menu boards in every single McDonald's across the entire world. That sort of usage would be very, very broad. Flash forwarding to today, well, now we've got like, if you look at the portrait and wedding market, um, you know, with digital photography, what I've noticed is there seems to be less of a focus on any kind of deliverable that is a print product. And, you know, sometimes you'll see portrait or wedding photographers who do offer print products, you know, that's kind of like the end goal is to do some sort of in-person sale with the portrait session and get them to purchase more print products uh, or wedding album, that sort of thing. But more often than not, I see people who just will deliver the digital files. Here you go. Um, either through a web link or through a, a you know thumb drive or something like that. Perhaps it's opportunity lost, but you know, the commercial photography world, there's then the new media, right? Well, we've got, you know, Back in the early 2000s, websites really started to pop up. And so then the, the need started to shift over to needing to populate these websites with images. Print media was still happening. But then, as you've noticed, things started to change. And now we've got like Instagram feeds, Instagram ads, Facebook ads, you know, YouTube ads, Google ads, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Social media, right? And that seems to be where quite a bit of commerce is being driven. So now you think about it, you're scrolling Instagram at home on your couch and you see some interesting ad and it says swipe up to see more and you click on it and it takes you to some website and you like what you see and you click purchase and it takes you to PayPal or some other pay service and you click on it and the next thing you know, the thing shows up in the mail. Pretty amazing technology, right? And now this is where a lot of this has shifted. We're, we're now looking at e-commerce as, you know, the way which commercial photographers are looking to make money. Earlier this year, I'd, I'd gone and um, done some digital tech work for a major furniture catalog. And I noticed that, you know, the, the, the need for the images in the actual printed catalog had had shrunk, but now the shot list was like almost all e-commerce stuff. It was all these different crops that we needed for all these different uh, new media placements that they're after. The main thing is that with portrait and wedding world, the end user is the direct client for their personal use. But in commercial photography, the whole purpose of those images is to make that client more money. 
commerce photography is what it is. They're used in commerce. So really that's like the playing field, right? You know, portrait wedding folks have like their sort of sales channel, which is the direct to customer sort of thing. That's the hurdle they're trying to get through is to sell that direct to customer. Whereas the commercial photography world, it's you have all these different channels, right? You know, there's there's all the various print publications to keep a track of, but then there's all this new media as well that's kind of housed under this gen general social media umbrella. Which means that for the commercial photographer that these are different areas for them to either limit or release, and that has value. So the thing is, is a lot of these small or medium-sized companies, which are the ones that are accessible to the newcomer to commercial photography, those companies, what they want is they want the most imagery for the broadest usage for the most amount of time that they can use in perpetuity for the least amount of money. But I'd argue that for that sort of middle tier of photographers out there in the world to survive, those uses must be limited. Now, some of these large firms usually need all reproduction rights. They don't want to be limited by having to call the photographer and say, hey, is it okay if I use it for such and such? They just want some sort of broad package that's going to cover their needs, right? And with that, that comes at a price. And so that's kind of the takeaway of this video is that if you're a newcomer to commercial photography and you're providing something of high value to a client and you're doing it for very little money, but you're providing this to them in perpetuity or uh, you know, lots of imagery for a low price and they can use it wherever, whenever, forever, that's not so good for the industry as a whole, okay? It, it's contributing to the race to the bottom and my hope is that this video will maybe elucidate some of that and ways to think about the value of your work because not only will the work potentially have value for you possibly to get more work, but for sure that work has value to the client that's hiring you to do it. So if you're liking this video so far, go ahead and hit the like sign, hit that subscribe. It really helps my channel grow. That would be awesome. Anyhow, we'll carry on. Now, some of these larger firms have so many channels that they're looking to target that they need the help of an ad agency. And the ad agency then, they know because they're designing the campaigns, they know where everything's gonna be placed, what sort of crop sizes they're working with, generally speaking, um, and the sorts of imagery that they're after. You know, these ad agencies are looking at targeting this imagery to specific audiences in specific placements. And so because of that, they're more exacting in their needs. But really, you know, the question of this whole thing is what is being traded? I mean, are you just trading your digital images for money? Are you saying, here you go, you can have the digital images for use, they're yours now. I would say maybe in a, you know, possibly in a portrait wedding context, you could consider it that once you're done with the wedding, you're like, here you go, you know, enjoy. And it's like personal use. But with companies that are making money off of that photography, are you really willing to just take those images and say, here you go, use them forever, wherever you want? Um, that sort of thing has really high value. And I think if you are willing to just hand your images over, again, it sort of devalues your work in the eyes of these companies. And then the companies say, oh, well, well, we don't have to do this whole usage thing anymore because these photographers nowadays will just give us the work and we can use it wherever, whenever, forever. But what's really being offered isn't money for images. It's money for the license, okay? The access to use those images in specific places for specific periods of time, okay? So let's look at this. The Copyright Act of 1976, which protects photographers and other creators, says specifically, copyright protection extends to original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression, now known or later developed, for which they can be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated, either directly or with the aid of a machine or device. So the Act defines these works of authorship as any of the following literary works, books and such, musical works, including any words, dramatic works, including music, pantomimes and choreography, pictorial, graphic or sculptural works that would cover photographers, motion pictures and other audiovisual works and sound recordings. Okay, so this means that you, by default, are the owner of your imagery. You control this unless you are under the employ of another entity, uh, which then it's called a work for hire arrangement or that you sign your copyright away specifically in writing in some sort of contract, by default, you are the creator of your work. You own the copyright, which means you own the right to copy, the right to reproduce that work in these variety of channels out there. This is, you guys, what you're trading for money. 
you're not trading money for images. You're trading money for the access for a company to use your images in specific media. So this sort of thing is controlled in the license agreement, which is hopefully within the contract and, you know, or spelled out in a specific license agreement that specifies the places that the images can appear, the amount of time they can appear and across what specific channels this work can appear. Now, in regards to your imagery as a commercial photographer, there are what I consider two piles of importance. Okay. One of those piles of importance is, has to do with the value of the imagery to you and your future. Okay. And then the second pile of importance has to do with the importance of that imagery to the client and their use to their future, making them more money. The sorts of ways that you will determine the importance of that imagery that you've created to yourself will be things like, is this image usable in stock? Can I make more money with this image beyond just this particular job? Or is there any value in these images to a third party? Okay, we'll talk about this. Is there any value to this image in your portfolio? Possibly some jobs you've gone on, you've gotten paid to do, and there was no value to those images to your portfolio. It was just sort of a bread and butter job that you did, you got paid, but you didn't really like the imagery and it's not something that you want to do again kind of thing. So that would be like low value for your portfolio. And then other jobs you do and they're like high value because it's the kind of work you, that you want to do, right? Or will this project create repeat business? Will Is this a client that has tons of work and therefore that's a negotiating point is the fact that it's going to be like repeat business for you. Okay, so then the way that a client is going to be determined and the importance of your work to them will be things like, can they get this image in stock? Like is what you're doing unique and interesting enough uh, that they need what you do? Or can they just scour stock imagery and find what they need and license the image there and save themselves some money? And will they get value for the money? You know, they're gonna pay a certain amount. Are they going to be getting what they need to do what they need to do? A lot of clients I have noticed over the years will try to write out of the gates, try to get the broadest usage possible. And I find I have to talk them off the ledge, so to speak, in that they, you know, want this like all reproduction rights, but they don't want to pay the huge fees that it would be for them to have that kind of broad usage. And that doesn't really even serve them that well because images get stale, you know? It's like, who wants to see the same image in a advertising campaign over and over and over again forever? They kind of want something, you know, fresh. Even if it's a campaign, you know, you want there to at least be newer imagery within that campaign. Um, but if a, a firm is just using the same old images over and over again, it's kind of like, yep, I'm seeing it. So it doesn't really serve them to even have images forever. Um, you know, I can see companies that are like catalog companies. Uh, that kind of imagery is different because, you know, it's like a product on white type shot. And that sort of thing will have lasting power. It'll last for a long time. Um, if they're still selling that same product, that product on white shot will be there for a long time. They'll also be looking at like where they can use the images. You know, is it okay if they put it on a billboard? Is it okay if they run it in 10 different magazines for an entire year that are national magazines? Can they use it regionally? Okay, that's probably more common than, than going national magazine. Just depends on who the client is and where they're taking these images. And is this, in, is this unique? Is it unique intellectual property? Are you bringing some sort of je ne sais quoi to this that's making the images that much better? Um, you know, there's this idea of perceived value photographers who have like clout in a particular, you know, genre of photography, the sort of Annie Leibovitzes of the world, you know, who, um, who arguably are more famous than some of the people that they're photographing. And, you know, that sort of unique intellectual property helps to, you know, make your imagery stand out, right? But if you're doing kind of like the same stuff as other people and you're just like editing it to look, you know, trendy and do, you know, if, if it's not really different, then it might be harder for an ad agency to really feel like, uh, you know, your look is going to be the next new trend or anything like that. And maybe it's not unique enough and they could find similar images on stock. It's either that or you're creating really just stock worthy shots. That would be another business model, you know, would say, well, you know, on the one hand, you're creating something that's a unique intellectual property, but maybe there's like this other work that you do that isn't. And it's really just like stock worthy images.
So let's take some examples of media and, you know, the kind of usage is what we're talking about here um, that would come up and sort of like these values, right? So let's think about like a cupcake on a yellow background. So like nothing special, just cupcake and it's a little cupcake holder with the frosting and it's sitting on just like a yellow sweep. It's just like a product shot, a uh, product food shot of a cupcake, right? So there's no logos. There's nothing really proprietary about it. You, you know, had to do a bunch of these shots, let's say for a local bake shop. And there was like cakes and you had like different colored backgrounds. And there was like some cakes and some cookies and some cupcakes and, you know, various baked goods for this, this bakery. But there's no like branding involved and they're, they're all fairly generic looking, you know, other than them being like product shots for this particular bakery that they're going to use, you know, on their website so that people could order online, that kind of thing. Possibly these images might have value to you in stock sales. I use this example because I worked with a photographer years ago who told me that one of her biggest selling stock images uh, was a picture of a cupcake on a yellow background. So that's why I use this example. So let's say maybe something like this is valuable to you as a potential stock image, but it's possibly maybe small value to you for your portfolio because it's kind of like product on white, but it's against different colored backgrounds. Like maybe as a series, it could be kind of interesting, but it depends on if you're looking as a photographer to do more of that type of work, then it would be value to your portfolio. But if it's like, you know, your cousin has a bake shop and you're just doing them a favor, but you really want to concentrate in this other genre of photographer, right? Then it would be kind of low value to your portfolio because it's not really what you want to be doing in the first place. It's just a bread and butter gig, right? But there's still value to this work to you, possibly as future stock sale. So with that, you need to maintain this sort of image as being what's called non-exclusive, okay? Um, there's exclusivity when a client needs you to not be using that imagery in anything else. No social media, no website, no nothing, right? You can't put it on a stock website. You can put it, can't put it on your website. They want the exclusive use of that imagery, okay? When a client needs exclusive use over the imagery, that price goes up, okay? Because that means that it's taking away your right to reproduce it in some other manner for probably a limited period of time. If you're smart, you wouldn't want to do that sort of thing in perpetuity. So if they're looking for in perpetuity, like forever, wherever, whenever, and they also want exclusivity, you know, I mean, essentially that's like a copyright buyout, really. That means like you can't use it for anything and they're using it forever. It's like, well, you know, that sort of thing should come at a very high price. Small bake shop is probably not going to pay for that. But these are the things you should think about, right? So maintaining non-exclusivity over that sort of image right in the contract, limiting the time use. So saying like, oh, maybe given like five years they can use and then they should refresh their images, come back and, and shoot some more. It's possible it might only be a couple years because they'll just say, yeah, we stopped using, you know, doing that particular um, type of, you know, we, we've got new cups for our cupcakes and we'd like to re-photograph them. So giving them, you know, some flexibility, but maybe it'll be like within two years, they'll come back to you looking for new work. You wanted to limit any type of buyout from this sort of thing. And you want to have sort of fixed period of time for fixed uses, right? And you're always going to limit that third party on the contract. No third party transactions. All right. So now let's look at another type of commercial photograph. We're going to look at one that's of a proprietary product, but photographed on like a white background, a catalog shot of some product that shows logos on it, or maybe it is some proprietary design. There's maybe NDA, which are non-disclosure agreements like that are involved because it's some new thing that they're designing, but they need photographs of it, that sort of thing, right? Um, that sort of image is going to have no value to in stock because you, at that point, you know, especially if there's NDAs involved, you're not going to really be able to, you'll be under an agreement that says that you can't really use those images for anything that these are for them only, right? And that sort of thing comes at a cost. So this sort of image is going to have very little to no value to you in stock, and it's probably going to have little to no value to you in your portfolio potentially. So really in this sort of thing, a negotiating point would be that exclusivity, you know, like maybe uh, for a period of time, they don't want it to get out, but after X amount of months that you are able to use it on your website, let's say it is like portfolio worthy shot that you create for them. Uh, but there's no stock value, right? So you're like, well, you know, I'd like to be able to use it on my, my website, my portfolio. And they say, okay, but it's going to have to come after the, you know, two year period or whatever. Another negotiating point would be the time period, right? Um, are they needing in perpetuity with something like this? 
Can the time be limited? Let's say five years, two years, five years, 10 years, something like that. So this is really the kind of job that I would probably try to be trying to push for all reproduction rights for them. I would say, you know, in my mind, I'd say there's no real stock value to this image for me. It's not necessarily something that I need in my portfolio. And, and it sounds like it's proprietary. They need the most usage. So with that, I would probably try to go for a real high day rate on it that would fold the usage fee into that real high day rate to try to get them to just like get the most usage, the most value out of it. And I can take my money to the bank and not worry about the rest of it. So then we look at say an image like of a lifestyle image of a person and that lifestyle image, you've got them model released, right? And it's like you did this shoot for let's say a clothing brand, okay? And it could be even like a small boutique clothing brand in your town. You did some beautiful shots out in, you know, the golden backlighting and all that um, of some good looking models in this clothing and you made sure to get model releases on them. This sort of image imagery would potentially have high value for you in stock. So it could be like future sales for you. And if you were looking to do more of this kind of work, it potentially would also be really high value for your portfolio, okay? So therefore you should, on this sort of shoot, you should maintain that non-exclusive status so that they don't have exclusive use. You can also use these images and get them on stock sites and get them on your portfolio and clients like this that are looking for some level of ex exclusivity. It's a new, you know, fashion line that they're, you know, wanting to, to get out there and they want some level of exclusivity, but you're noticing that the images have high value to you. Well, then you would want to try to limit the time period of it, that exclusivity. You would say, you know, can we go you know, exclusive for six months, give them time for them to get their campaign out there, you know, and then after that, it goes into non-exclusive. But this is the kind of photograph that you'd want to like limit any kind of buyout and really reduce any sort of in perpetuity sort of scenario, okay? You would want to limit to that fixed time for fixed uses. So our next example would be like an architectural image. If you're an architectural photographer and you have access to a particular space um, one place that you've been hired by, let's say, an architect or an interior designer to photograph, that sort of thing would have probably high value to your portfolio, you know, to access to a beautiful location and a beautiful um, place. And then you photograph it and you do a bang up job and they're happy and you could use that sort of thing in your portfolio. And then it might not have low high value in stock because possibly agencies don't really, you know, what, what's the value to them of, of a picture of somebody else's building. It might not be something that an agency can really sell easily. Right? So high value for you, for your portfolio, low value for you for stock, let's say, but high value potentially for third-party sales. An interior designer hires you to shoot this, but then you can get information on who the architect was. Well, they might be somebody who's willing to kick in some money and license some of these images. Um, potentially you find out who the contractor who built the place, they might be interested in licensing some images. You know, maybe there's like a landscape designer, heck, maybe even like the person who painted it, you know, maybe they have access to that. Maybe you've had access to this property and you're doing before and after stuff for a construction firm, right? And then you're hired by a construction firm. You go in, you do a bunch of before, and then when it's done, you go in and bunch of, do a bunch of after. That's a great scenario because then you can take those images and try to sell them to the architect, the interior designer, the landscape designer, they help. then would have all the before and after, that sort of thing would be high value. So in that sort of scenario, you'd be definitely looking to limit any kind of third party transactions. The client doesn't have rights to do that. You're the copyright holder. You're the one that's going to make sure that that's in there. No third party sales, no third party transactions. You would probably definitely need to make sure that you keep these non-exclusive so that of course you can use them. If they need some sort of exclusivity over the images, again, limit the time period for that so that after that's up, you then have, it's back to non-exclusive and you can use those images for other purposes. You'd be going for a fixed time for fixed uses, or if they need all reproduction rights, then you would want a really high rate for that. So then we look at say like an advertising image and this will depend on the nature of the advertising image um, as far as like what the genre of it is. Is it people-based, product-based, that kind of stuff. And really like sort of the intellectual property, the, uh, the creative value of it, okay? So this sort of thing, if you're interested in doing more advertising photography, of course would have high value to your portfolio, especially if it's a, you know, sort of a household brand that you did a campaign for. That brings a lot of clout to your business, a lot of notoriety that you worked on such and such 
you know, sort of campaign. And it could potentially, depending upon the image, have value to you in stock. Okay, so that would be something it would just depend. It would also depend on if there's, you know, model releases involved, and that would dictate whether it has value to you in stock. And so in that sort of thing, again, you know, if you're doing something advertising, you're most likely working with some sort of ad agency, they'll have very specific uses for these that you're gonna need to find out. So you're gonna get the full scope of this project from them as far as where these things are going and for how long. And you're gonna be looking to limit the time and limit the use based upon the scope of this project. So editorial imagery is interesting because that sort of stuff could potentially have high value to your portfolio, right? Especially if it's published and you can use some of it as tear sheets, it brings notoriety and clout to the work that you do. Like, hey, look, I'm a published photographer, right? And so that sort of thing is high value to your por portfolio, possible value in stock, depending upon the nature of the image and what sort of releases are involved, right? Model releases and such. But a magazine is typically going to try to get the most use out of you as possible. So I've noticed that a lot of these magazines that have like an umbrella corporation and many magazines underneath them, um, they delineate that they have to have this freedom to use the images between these magazines, right? They, they want to leave that door open for themselves. And so with this, I can try to negotiate a higher rate. Doesn't always work that angle really with editorial. They're kind of like, eh, well, we don't know because they're taking a risk. They're like, well, we don't know whether you're going to deliver amazing images or not, right? So like, here's, this is the rate, you know, and this is what we've negotiated for, you know, your rate and the assistant and post-production and whatever other materials might be involved, whatever the project requires, right? But what I can do is I can, negotiate for reprint fees. So if they do in the future, six years from now, reprint one of my images in another publication within the company, they send me a fee for that. And that model works out pretty good. So a lot of the questions you have to ask yourself when you're working with your own commercial imagery and the kind of photography that you do for companies is to ask yourself, does this image serve me and my portfolio? And if the answer is yes, then you're gonna be looking to maintain non-exclusive status. You don't want them to necessarily have exclusive use over this, certainly not for forever. Forever. You know, if, if they need exclusivity for whatever campaign they're working on, and then, then you're gonna agree upon a time period, time period of exclusivity, and then it's released back to you as non-exclusive and you can use it for other things, okay? You're looking to control that. But if it doesn't serve you in your portfolio, well, then you can just charge more money because at that point, it doesn't sound like that imagery is really useful to you. You know, imagine you're hired to shoot a bunch of widgets on a white background. It's like, well, you know, the only person that really cares about these images is the client, right? The only person that really cares about these images is the client. Client. It's not serving you in your portfolio at all. And it's not something that you can sell in stock or to any third party. So really you should have a, a good day rate for that and get paid well to shoot this like schlock that you don't really want to be shooting anyhow. But with that, you could probably be a little looser with your usage channels, you know, as far as like they need a little bit more freedom. And it's like, well, at that point, like, it, you know, it's not going to sell in stock and, and you don't care about it for your portfolio. And you know, at that point you could maybe be a little bit more flexible with um, how they need to use it. But you're still always gonna be looking to limit third-party transactions, and you're always gonna be looking to limit any kind of copyright buy buyout unless it comes at a high price. The other question you're gonna ask yourself is, does this image hold value to you beyond this initial sale? Does it hold value in stock? Uh, are there any opportunities with like the magazine for reprint fees? Um, are there third-party sales that you could foresee in this? One time I took this workshop with this photographer in Connecticut and the workshop was for photographing interiors. Okay, that was like what the workshop was is he was gonna teach us about lighting and photographing interiors. Well, come to find out we get there and the, the home that we were photographing was his. And he had bought this 1700s farmhouse in Connecticut and he was in the process of remodeling areas of it. And his wife was a writer who had pitched an article about how they were remodeling this old 1700s farmhouse, right? To some sort of like boutique magazine. So she was probably getting probably, you know, a dollar per word for a 500 or 750, maybe thousand word article about the things that they were doing to remodel their 1700s farmhouse, right? And then there was a fee for the photographs for it. So you know, they're getting like whatever, maybe $750,000 for the article. 
and then probably $1,500 or so for the photographs. And then he says, hey, let's bring in some fools to pay us some more money and we'll show them how to photograph an interior, right? And because they had the, the, the contract to, to do this work, they were able to then get at cost from a variety of different manufacturers, a new range, a new dishwasher, solid surface countertops, and some sort of like tin ceiling from some tin ceiling manufacturer, just to, you know, be able to plug the names of these companies. These are the people that we used, and then that would be published out there. So we basically got his like kitchen redone at cost, and they came and like installed this stuff because these companies were excited to have their name put in this particular magazine in this article. And then he got money from the people that he got to come take the workshop. And then he got money for the photographs from that specific workshop that he was taking and showing us all how to do it. And then his wife was getting paid for the, the written article. So that would be like an incredible use of like third party sales for a given project, right? So if it holds value to you beyond the initial sale, stock, reprint, third party sales, then you need to copy, keep your copyright solid. You need to maintain non-exclusive status over that. If they have to have some sort of exclusivity over the images, you're going to try to ne negotiate that to like a small time period so that then you can get out of that and start using the images in other ways, right? You're going to limit that time. You're going to negotiate reprints on magazines if you can, and you're going to actively sell to the third party. You know, but if it doesn't have any future value, really, then you can kind of be a little looser about, um, you know, these different channels. Um, you know, if they're needing all reproduction, obviously, then you need to have a higher price tag on that. But I would say, you know, particularly with magazines, try to negotiate reprint fees and always limit third-party transactions. So the other thing to consider here is, will this become a regular gig? If the answer is yes, you know, if there's a lot of work coming your way, you realize, wow, these guys actually hire me a lot. They have a ton of stuff. I'm, I'm busy constantly. You should really be looking to reward your return customers, right? Be a little bit looser about usage, um, use, looser about time and place, because they keep coming back and providing this sort of thing. You know, you, still, you never want to just be like, yeah, use them forever, whenever, forever in perpetuity. Still maintain a certain amount of control over your images for, you know, time and place. But you can try to be a little bit looser. You know, it's, it's all just like a give and take. It's like this negotiation you're doing to try to figure out what they really need these images for and for how long. And then you figuring out how you can give them the closest thing to what they really need. Uh, within the price that they're willing to pay. But, you know, the main thing is, is if it's not a return customer, you know, if you sense that this is just a one-off, there's no reason for you to be giving away anything because they're never going to return anyhow. You know, you might as well try to get the most you can in that scenario. But if they're coming to you with a, we have a lot of work, we have, this is, you know, a wonderful opportunity for repeat business kind of thing. That's a scenario where you might consider coming up with some sort of looser agreement over time. But if it's a one-off, then you should be trying to get paid well. So who's going to go for this? You know, like, I mean, let's, let's be real. Like nowadays we got like a, just a surplus of photographers out there who are like, here you go, you know, take the, put it on a thumb drive and, oh, I don't know. They're not paying attention to usage at all and not limiting this. And so that's sending this message to companies out there in the world that there's plenty of photographers that are willing to do that. And it's just going to depend on the quality of the imagery, kind of like you get what you pay for sort of thing. If you are a photographer that you're starting to look at your work and compare it to other higher paid commercial photographers, and you're giving away the farm, well, you might consider changing your business model, or you might be out of work, you know, in the future. Things might not work out for you because you won't be able to pay your overhead. You might be wondering, how is that commercial photographer driving in a BMW, but I'm still cruising around on my Toyota Corolla? I don't understand. So this sort of thing's probably not going to go over well with the really small mom and pop type commercial jobs. You know, if you're like, well, I just want to shoot for my area businesses and you come in hot with usage, they're going to be like, we don't know what you're talking about. And it's going to be hard for you to, you know, kind of get them on board with any kind of idea of like usage fees. What's that? It's going to be better for you to just spell out where they can use these images and then limit other things. Limit, I tend to limit national magazine advertising and I'll limit billboard use and I'll limit third party transactions. You know, and I'm in, I would say kind of a smaller town in the United States of as far as towns or cities go. And even still, we have billboards out on our highway here. And so that sort of thing happens, you know, people say, oh, here, you know, here's the images from that shoot. And then they throw it up on a billboard and you don't get paid a dime for that. You have to limit that sort of stuff. But 
Often on my contract, I don't go and exhaust them with all of this stuff. I just tell them where they can use the images and where they can't. But I also leave the door open so that if they're curious about something like billboards or national magazine advertising, that they have the ability to contact me and discuss that further. You see, there's this sort of surge of photographers now who are willing to give all this stuff away. And that has now told the companies, oh, now, well, there's a photography is ubiquitous. We have people who will just shoot this stuff for us and not Usage doesn't even come up. They'll just hand us the thumb drive and we can use it forever, wherever, whenever. And what that does is it ends up devaluing the photographer's work and it devalues the industry as a whole. You know, and there's those eager beavers out there that are really just trying to get their images out there because they want more likes or they want more followers or they just like seeing their work in use. I like seeing my work in use too. I also like licensing my images for money. So how do we fix this? You know, like, well, you know, part of this channel that I'm starting is really the idea of opening up some of these discussions around usage, around copyright, around um, around the sort of issues of transparency. Um, you know, a lot of this is kind of a dark art. And, in, and for years, you know, photographers wouldn't really talk to each other. And, you know, I think it's important that photographers talk to each other and say, hey, what is kind of a reasonable like range for this kind of a job? Um, having those relationships with other photographers who are within your sort of realm of the work that you do and say, hey, what's kind of like the going thing? I want to be within that same range. I don't want to be like undercutting other people intentionally. So, you know, we need to maybe talk about this. That's really valuable. That's really valuable when you can find people in your community that you can have those kinds of real conversations with and it not be a weird thing, you know, because it's not, it's not like, hey, how can I do what you do so that you aren't able to do it? That would be undercutting, right? It's more like, hey, how can I figure out like so that we're not competing on price, but instead they're compete we're competing based upon the quality of the work that we do and and whether the style of work is best for that particular campaign, right? You know, when ad agencies looking at portfolios, they're not just looking at who's capable of doing this thing. They're looking at who's the right fit visually for the campaign. So my recommendation is that photographers out there doing commercial photography should really be looking at the value of their work for their future, looking at the value of the work for the client, how they value this work, and they should be looking to at least limit things like the exclusivity, limit the time period that the images are going to be in play, limit the space that it's being used in. Oh, is it going full page in a magazine ad or is it only a quarter page? Well, those are different prices, right? It's different prices for them to pay for those advertisements. Therefore, it's probably going to be a different fee for you to charge. And then you're going to be looking at limiting third party transactions. You don't want to hand over your images and then find them being used in some other manner by some other company altogether. If that's a third party transaction. You should be getting a fee for that work. So like a, a typical customer client might say, well, we really just need the images for our website and social media use, right? They say that, but you never know what the future will hold for them, whether they'll want to run some ads in a local magazine or anything like that. Uh, maybe they'll want to put a billboard up. So it's important that you try to make, you try to get extra fees for that extra stuff, right? And so I would probably put right in the contract, you know, under the usage clause for web and social media use only for five years, okay? Uh, maybe even less time than that, web and social media use for two years, okay? No third-party transactions, no billboard use, no national magazine ads. But I'd always put in a nice little clause that says, please inquire with Jeff for additional uses. Maybe there's a typical kind of print and web. Maybe they, they do know that they're probably going to do some printing with these images somewhere in some way. Maybe it's like in-house collateral of some kind, or maybe it's like point of sale posters they're looking to create. You know, maybe it's like a restaurant menu board, that kind of thing. These are all things that you have to tweeze out when you find out the scope of the project in the beginning stages of the job. So maybe it would be like web and social media use, in-house collateral bro brochures and point of sale for five years. And again, no third-party transactions, no national magazine ads, no billboards, okay? Maybe another would might be, you know, they need it for their website, they need it for social media, and they need full-page ads in three national publications, full-page for 12 months each. Maybe you could try to, like, limit the web and social media. You know, if you start getting into, well, we don't want to be limited by time period because it's, like, catalog work, right? It's, like, 
a lot of you maybe you're a studio that's shooting a bunch of product on white but you're also doing like beauty shots that kind of stuff so some of it's valuable to your portfolio some of it's not but it's all value valuable to them and maybe a lot of the product shots are are evergreen shots for them you know they can just use that forever um, because it's like just a product that they're not going to change necessarily or they're still selling that same thing well that kind of stuff you know when you get into them saying well we don't want you know the 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 any kind of limits on the time like how do we get rid of that then at that point you bring your price up you say well you know if we start going in perpetuity with this well then my fee is going to go up and that's the cost so again my hot tip here is always have some sort of like friendly clause at the bottom of your usage that states the usage states what you can't be using these images for but then leaves the door open by saying something like um, you know, does not include national advertising, billboard, or third-party transactions. Please kindly inquire with Jeff should you need these types of services at email address, okay? So that whoever's got this contract and they're looking it over, an attorney inside their, you know, corporate facilities is scoping the contract, and they say, oh, well, it says right here we can't do that, so we need to contact them and find out what it's going to look like for us to use these images in some national magazine ads. And then they call you, and then you give them a price make more money. You know, in the beginning, websites, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of a given. It was like, well, yeah, of course we have to have a website. And it was almost seen as like this sort of low value sort of thing, despite the fact that when you think about it, a website's really worldwide usage. Everybody on the planet can look up that website and see those images now, right? That's a lot of eyes should everybody happen on the planet to look up your, that website. You know, in some ways, it's still kind of is that way it's kind of seen as this sort of low value thing to clients oh everybody's got a website I don't understand why I can't use it on my website it's like well that's it's really it's like kind of worldwide everybody can see those images right honestly it's kind of strange that websites were pegged in the very beginning as being this low value sort of thing when they are very high value but the thing now that's become high value is social media right now we have all these social media channels all these ways in which they can like run ads on social media and it can be hard for a photographer to kind of figure out, well, you know, how do we even figure out with all these different social channels, you know, what the real value is, okay? So some of these music licensing companies have started to do some of this where I've noticed, you know, when I'm working on a video and I want to like pull some music and it's on like a royalty-free site, but then there's other like rights managed songs and I'll go and I'll check out sort of like what the deal is if I wanted to use that song in a, in a commercial video, right? And then they'll, one of the questions they ask is, you know, is there going to be any kind of advertising revenue put into this? And how much, you know, where is this going to be displayed? Oh, it'll be like in a Facebook ad, right? And okay, well, is the ad revenue, you know, zero to $500? Is it 501 to 1,000? Is it 1,000 to 5,000? Is it, or is it 5,000 plus? They're asking like, how much of a budget does the client have, you know, to get this out there? And the higher that budget is, the higher the fee is for me to license that music track, okay? So, you know, why can't photographers do this? Like, it seems like that would be a reasonable thing to kind of figure out, like, that sort of stuff. You know, I mean, the small companies, they don't always know, like, how or when they're going to use these images. Um, I, it's rare that, you know, other than, like, we website and social media, you know, maybe that's just, like, their Instagram feed for their, you know, for their brewery or whatever. And they just, you know, but they kind of, like, want to, not be limited they want to have these images on file for the future in case maybe one of their other marketing people are like oh hey we should do some new menus and have some photos on there oh well hey we have some photos of our beers from this brewery let's use those you know so this is kind of the stuff you have to think about as a commercial photographer of what you're willing to kind of let hang on file for them to use over and over and over again and you see zero dollars after the fact because you know even if you got like paid two grand for the job that two grand disappears after a couple months in a business probably sooner than that really you know, the big companies know how, when, and, for, you know, where they're going to be placing these images. But they also might want them for their database for later, depending, again, like we talked about, like product on white and that kind of stuff. You know, these companies will want to keep their product on file for future use. All this stuff comes at a fee. You know, you have to be 
um, delivering a high enough of a day rate to make it worth it for you to say, well, I'm going to do this work and they're going to be able to use these images in perpetuity, right? Well, it's got to be worth it for everybody. Agencies, however, they know or they should know exactly how they're using the images because they're the ones designing the campaign. So they're going to know things like what the aspect ratio of the shot needs to be, where copy is going to fall in the image if we're designing around that. And if they know that much, they know generally where these images are going to be going. And that's all information you can tweeze out of them. And when you find out the scope of the project, which helps you to create the estimate. So some shooters keep it easy and they just fold the usage right into their creative fee. It's one big number. And then they state within that contract, here are the areas that you can use these images and here's the areas that you can't. And then they let it be that. Um, other types of projects, they, the client or the agency might require you to list out every single different usage for the different channels of use as line items, which of course opens you up to the possibility of them like starting to, to say, oh, removing line items to save money, right? Um, but it just depends, you know, but I would say if it's falling within that total budget range, um, that, that you're hoping to try to get them to anchor, say, you know, hey, what's the budget range of this project? Maybe they'll be willing to tell you, oh, well, looks like, you know, there is 27,000 budgeted for this project. If you can try to come in, you know, under that and still show that you're going to give, you know, what they need, then the likelihood of getting the job is higher. For the small firms, if you're a commercial photographer just starting out and you're shooting for like mom and pop type businesses, I'd for sure assess the value of that imagery that I'm creating for them for my purposes. You know, does it have value in stock? Does it have value for my portfolio? Is there potential for third party transactions outside of here for me? And I'm going to do my best to do my co cost of doing business. Of course, I need to know what my minimum rate is. And if you're curious about calculating your minimum rate, you can check out my video here on that. And you got to know how long it takes you to do these jobs and what gear you need and if there's going to be any additional crew. You know, if you're doing a specific type of commercial photography, you should very much have done that before so that you can generally know how long it's going to take you to do this job. So that will help you estimate, oh, well, how long is it going to take me to shoot X amount of items on location at their shop? Well, you go and scout the location to see what the shop is like figure out like what sort of challenges am I going to have here? What kind of lighting do I need? Do I need an extra crew member? Do I need two assistants? What do I need here? And then determine, you know, oh yeah, it's probably going to take me about, but it'll take me a day to shoot this, you know, and then, you know, or maybe it'll take more than that. So you start with that minimum rate, right? And then you start figuring out, well, how long is it going to take you to do this? Your crew, the gear you need, all of that. Then I look at the scope of the project, the kind of usage that they're going to need, what they're looking for out of this project and where they're going to use these images. Maybe it's just web and social media. Okay. Um, and at that point I pad that for my profit margin. Okay. Based upon the scope of the project. And then I limit the time and space and the usage and I limit the third party transactions. So listen, there is a, a huge amount of shooters out there that are willing to give their work away to companies for free or you know, in trade for like a hat or some shoes or something like that, right? And a lot of this, I think, is simply just due to ignorance. They don't understand that for a long time, there's been usage fees involved and that there should be usage fees. And at the higher level photographers, there's still usage fees involved. But these, you know, sort of lower level commercial shooters are being taken advantage of by these companies that say, oh, well, we, we can just send these guys some free shoes. They don't care. They'll send us some images that we can use. And that, you know, the, the, the idea of like undercutting, right, I think is it's an intentional one. That's like if somebody is, let's say, a wedding photographer and their work is for sure comparable to the $3,000 wedding photographer in their town, but then they tell the a client that comes in, oh, I'll do it for seven fifty. dollars Well, that's undercutting, you know, that they, if their work is worth as much as the $3,000 photographer in town, um, they should really be charging that much too, not undercutting all the photographers in town whose work is just as good. I've experienced this as a wedding videographer in my past where, you know, people come in with their DSLR and they're, they're willing to shoot that wedding and, and deliver the full wedding, the full ceremony, the, the whole reception, all the toasts, the whole thing. Um, and they're shooting all of it with their DSLR camera and, you know, charging 700 bucks. So that sort of thing is the race to the bottom. And, um, 
there's, you know, the photographers or videographers who are out there doing this sort of stuff and they're just ignorant to what they really should be getting paid to do it, to stay in business. And then there's the ones who are intentional about it, who know that they could be charging, but for whatever eager beaverness they are desperate for portfolio or what have you, they're willing to charge very, very low rates when they know that they could be charging more. They're maybe just desperate to like build portfolio, right? But value in your imagery and having control over the usage is going to help you stay in business for the long haul to be able to make more money and keep more money in your business and also pay yourself more, which will contribute to the longevity of your career. Some of this race to the bottom of, you know, the newbie photographer is willing to, to you know, do photo shoots in trade for some shirts or something. You know, it's contributing to this race to the bottom and it sends this message to companies that, well, they can, they, there's a huge supply of photographers willing to do it for free. So why are we going to hire somebody, right? That who might be good. And, you know, I, I've lost work to this sort of thing specifically for, from companies looking for like lower end imagery. Um, they would rather get like mediocre images for super cheap than get something that's like very detailed and polished. That's going to cost them money. Okay. So it's sort of this battle of like the mediocre for free versus, you know, paying for something that's good. You know, an example of this, there's stories that I hear out there about agencies, um, that are, you know, starting to adopt some of these hiring trends. For example, they could hire a photographer who's been around for, you know, 20 or 30 years, somebody who's done a lot of th this particular type of job that's on deck. And that photographer estimates, you know, for the usage and, you know, for the 20 images that they need, um, it's going to be $30,000. Okay. For the production, for everything involved, um, that the, the final tab, you know, tag on that project is going to be 30 grand for those, you know, 20 images, let's say. So then the ad agency says, oh, well, we could just like, you know, do we need, you know, the super high end photographer imagery or do we need, you know, just some like mediocre stuff that kind of fits the bill? So they hire like five newbies who might have like good social media followings, pay them a thousand bucks a day and ask them to provide 40 images each. So then they end up not with 20 images, but now they end up with 200 total images for the agency to choose from, right? For a whole lot less money. And there's pros and cons to this. You know, I've heard about this trend and then they find out later like, oh, they go on the shoot with one, one of the newcomers and the, the production value is really low. Everybody, there's no coffee on set and everybody's heart starving and they forgot to bring a strobe light and, you know, all of a sudden it's cloudy. The photographer's inexperienced and they don't know how to deal with the changing situations, changing conditions. So what they end up getting is images that are of lower quality. Um, there's, you know, not attention to styling, things like that. You know, the production saving a bundle in the end, sure. And they get more images overall and they're offering a client a value based upon this, like a larger amount of total images, you know, that probably are just coming to them with all rights. Here you go. All rights. You get, you get to use them wherever, whenever, forever. And they've finagled this out of these newbie photographers. Okay, this is a trend that I have heard about on a variety of podcasts that I listen to and hearing about it from other commercial photographers, you know, that have lost out on jobs to them going to some other sort of model. But a lot of this comes down to what I see as volume marketing. Okay. And, you know, I'm not a, like a marketing expert by any means, but you know, if you just pay attention to this kind of stuff, it starts, the patterns start to become clear. You know, the, the idea of like great images versus mediocre is what's sort of driving some of this. If it supposedly takes like 15 times or so of you seeing an ad before it becomes imprinted indelibly in your mind, um, well, then that would say for a marketing person that it, it's less important for them to get you to photograph one great shot and then them show that out there in the world. It's going to be better for them to get like 15, 20 or more images of a campaign out in front of people over and over and over again. Therefore, in some cases, it might matter less that the imagery is of a super high production or high quality. It's like it only matters in getting images in front of the most eyeballs possible and that the imagery itself can be of relatively low quality, which is a major bummer for photographers out there who strive for high quality. Think of Got Milk, that campaign, right? The milk mustache and milk pouring over people and just like, you know, the different things they were doing, port portrait scenarios of people with milk, right? 
I mean, we know of this campaign. They flooded the magazines and advertising channels with that specific campaign. It wasn't particularly like, you know, complex, technically uh, simple, but of high quality. But they did a lot of them to get a lot of that out there so that we remember the Got Milk campaign or think of like, ba, 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 I'm loving it. You know, like we know where that comes from. So social media is operating on this same marketing principle. They're like, well, why would we have like, you know, five amazing images when we can get 200 that are like pretty good and get 200 out there for all the eyes to see over and over and over and over again. At the time of this video, fall of 2021, I have seen the BNH story of Jack and Barbara, the wildlife photographers. Every single time I open up YouTube, it just keeps feeding me that for some reason, probably because I shop at B&H. So really, you know, when it comes down to the question of like, well, where's the money? Where are the high ticket jobs? It's gonna, I think, be um, either in these scenarios where you're working for companies or agencies where they need campaigns, they need volumes of images within a particular campaign um, and at that point, if you're doing some sort of like advertising campaign, the level of imagery quality still needs to be high. Um, whereas, you know, these lower level projects where, you know, you're doing just social media type stuff, it's like, you know, there's, there's really, I've even heard about them not wanting things to look highly polished like advertising images. They almost want it to look like off the cuff images that somebody's just like taken with their phone, right? Something really loose. So photographers have a choice. You know, you, if you are a high level creative thinker and you can create campaigns like this, treatments, mood boards, that sort of thing, maybe you think like an art director and, and you can craft up interesting ideas, then you might very well be able to get quite a bit of work in the advertising industry if you're coming and you have lots of ideas for particular types of things and you can operate at this high level. But if you prefer to shoot high volume and keep production value low, then you might be better off aiming for those firms that disseminate that sort of imagery. It just depends on your goals visually, of course, and what your goals are for your career um, and the kind of money that you hope to make. But I would say seller, you're the seller, seller beware. You know, to do work for some of these firms that just want in perpetuity uh, in trade for some shoes or some shirts or whatever, if you're not limiting time, space, exclusivity, third-party transactions, that kind of thing, um, then you're kind of giving away the farm. No matter what it is, whether it's like high volume social media content that um, doesn't need super high production value, but they just need like huge quantity, the value of that imagery to the client is still high. The value of that imagery to the client is still high. And you should become aware of this. And, you know, this is because these images are used to make them more money. It's photography for commerce. With the big firms, you're just going to need to assess the imagery for you and your future and also assess it in terms of what you feel the value is to the client. And you need to then get the full scope of where these images are going, how they're going to be used, for how long do they need to use them to determine the usage and create your price based on that. If it's low value to you, but high value to them and high volume, well, then you can offer full reproduction, but you should be getting a really good day rate for that. In short, of all of this, it comes down to the good, cheap, fast, right? You can only pick two. You know, you may want it good and cheap. Well, you're, it won't be fast. You want it fast and cheap. Well, it's probably not gonna be very good. And if you want it good and fast, it's not gonna come cheap. Coming up soon, I'm gonna be working on a video about creating estimates using estimating software. Hope you liked this video. If you did, hit that thumb sign. If you didn't, you know what to do. You can leave comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you guys do out there for um, sort of figuring out the value of your commercial photography. Um, if you're just giving it all away because it's easier or if you're looking to limit certain things, I'd love to know. Let me know down in the comments. Please subscribe, it keeps my channel alive. Hit that little bell, it'll tell you when new videos are coming out. Thanks for watching, see you again.